Community Connections CBS Local sounds, thoughts, passions, and success Happy Monday, Waterloo Region. It is Monday, the 21st, no, the 20th of September, the last day of summer and election day. Go out and vote. We have as a guest today, Bo Markham from KW VegFest, which is happening again, I think, this Saturday. We'll be speaking with Mo in just a bit. We've also got a lot of music today from Canadian artists and a lot of people from KW as well. So we'll be listening to that. Listening right now to the Raul Santo Domingo Experience. This is a song called, or a, a piece called, Scuppernong and Fufra. A wonderful title. Raul Santo Domingo Experience.
And that's the Raul Santiago, so, so Raul Santo Domingo experience. We'll be hearing more from Raul Santo Domingo in a, in a bit. Uh, he's a local fellow uh, from Waterloo, so hope to have him in the studio at some point. Do have in the studio Mo Markham. Good morning, Mo. Mo is the organizer for KW Veg Fest, which is happening when, Mo? Sunday, September 26th. Sunday, September. Yeah, at the Kitchener Farmer's Market. Is it uh, an in-person experience, or are we doing this online again? It is an in-person experience this time, um, and it will be, uh, all of the uh, festival will be outside in the outdoor portions of the market, except for the speakers, um, which will be inside. So um, that's the only portion of the, the festival that we will have to require the vaccine passports for is the inside portion. Yeah, I guess vaccine passports have uh, taken place as of, what, Wednesday this week? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just a few days before, so um, so that will be um, uh, possible. That will be necessary for the uh, for the speakers area inside, unfortunately. Right. right. And are you doing that as an organizer of the event, or is that being handled by Kitchener uh, staff, KW staff? Um, it will actually be the market staff who will be um, um, asking for the passports. Um, they will have a. Um, uh, they will have a staff person there okay. asking for the passports. Good. We are also doing contact tracing in that area, in the speakers area, and we're doing that ourselves. And in in the um, in the patio area, in the eating area, okay. uh, the rest of the festival, you know, we're having to pay attention and want to, of course, to all the COVID restrictions. So uh, there will be people will be counted in so that we're not uh, oh. overcount on in any of the areas and uh, social distance. The booths are all set up so that they are social distance from each other as well. And, you know, so it's it's been a bit complicated. I'll bet. This year for yeah, sure. I'll bet. Yeah. Yeah, it's just so nice to have everybody crowd into Carl's Air Square the uh, first year that you put it on. How long have you been, have you been doing <laughs> this now? Uh, this is our fourth year, but last oh. year actually our festival was virtual. So, right. so we did two in-person festivals in 2018, 2019, and then um, and then this will be our third in-person okay. one. Is there a virtual component this time? Uh, no, um, but uh, speakers um, will be, um, uh, you know, will be recorded and we okay. will uh, screen. Um, we will uh, have those on our uh, Facebook page and our website cool. afterwards as well. If you get anything interesting, uh, suitable for radio broadcast, let me know. <laughs> oh, I will. There's, there are some really good ones. So there's a panel um, that's, you know, all about the animals. Um, so um, it will be um, uh, Kevin Leahy is a um, <clears throat> um, uh, fellow who did undercover investigation on uh, farms and uh, for a number of years for uh, Mercy for Animals and another organization. And uh, he also um, did undercover work um, in Asia in the dog meat farms mm. um, there. And so he has experience with both. And uh, he will be speaking on the panel and also two uh, people, one of whom you know, Tamara Brown, oh, yes. um, who had Tamara has a micro sanctuary uh, for chickens and roosters mm -hmm. and out, outside of Cambridge. And then there's also uh, Jamie Cerna, and uh, she is part of Love of Brian, another sanctuary, um, a larger sanctuary that has uh, a number of different animals. So the three of them will be speaking. Um, we also have uh, Dr. Linda Plowright, uh, who is a psychiatrist from the London area. And uh, uh, Linda will be talking about... Um, uh, mental health and uh, the food that we eat and and how veganism can help uh, help people you know eating healthy and eating a vegan diet can help um, with mental health issues and just health issues in general mm -hmm. and uh, then we also have um, uh, Dr. Tushar Mehta um, who is a fabulous speaker um, he will be talking about the connection between animal agriculture and uh, climate breakdown and also um, the connection with pandemics um, and, uh, you know, the animals uh, on our plates and, and the connections to the pandemics that um, ha we have had in the past and we will have in the future if we don't uh, make change. And we also may have a lawyer, but um, there's a bit of a conflict there, so we're not 100% sure. So. Right. That's, that's, that's just a speaker lineup. You've just... 
and out. just the speaker lineup that's right that's that's incredible <laughs> um, yeah we also will have uh, live music and uh, nearly 40 uh, vendors uh, selling all kinds of things oh cool any idea of the uh, the musical lineup uh, at this point, we have uh, Gaia's Eye, uh, Gabriel Nadler from um, uh, from um, Toronto, and we have a couple of others that are not confirmed yet. Everything's been very last minute uh, um, on this, I, I must say, but um, but I think we will have some other live music that that's uh, more local as well. Right, and then outside, outside you'll have um, booths, vendors, uh, people that's selling right. things. <laughs> people advocating for things. That's right. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, food from um, all over the world. We have um, East Indian food, Chinese, Japanese, um, Jamaican, um, Turkish. Uh, I don't want to leave anyone out. Um, you know, lots of Canadian food um, as well. Uh, there's going to be ice cream and donuts. And um, we have some uh, downtown vendors um, who will be joining us. Uh, from here from Kitchener, um, Cafe Pyrus and uh, Queen Shawarma mm -hmm. and uh, the Crafty Ramen. And um, then, you know, vendors from uh, uh, from all over the province um, as well um, will have all kinds of uh, things uh, being sold. So um, look forward to um, the ice cream and the donuts will be popular for yes. sure. Um, and, um, you know, uh, sausages and, uh, you know, vegan sausages, of mm -hmm. course. And, yeah. yeah. Um, and cheeses and just everything you can imagine. Yeah, it was really popular. The I, I didn't um, attend the virtual festival last year, but I went to the uh, the first couple, and it was absolutely mm -hmm. wonderful. The the food is great. You know, it's uh, a lot of people think that uh, you know vegan food can't possibly be very good, but it's that's not the case at all. A lot of people think that vegan sp food uh, is made to taste good by just adding spices and 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 you know, peppers and sauces and stuff like that. That's not the case either. There's, there's just so yeah. much variety and, and good things out there. There is. I mean, and if you think about it, you know, there are maybe um, seven or eight different kinds of meat that people eat, um, uh, you know, on a regular basis. But there are thousands of plants out there, you know, that we eat. Um, you know, so much variety and so much can be done with them to, to make them interesting, you know. And, um, you know, nobody... Nobody eats uh, meat without, you know, without other things added to it, right? So yeah. simply do those same same things in a different, sometimes in a different way, sometimes a very similar way uh, to um, plants. And, you know, you have some amazing food, yeah. um, really good food. Yeah. Well, you have somebody speaking on making a transition from uh, a non-vegan diet to veganism? Um, I think Dr. Linda Plowright will talk a little bit about that as well. Um, we were trying to find uh, someone who would just talk about, you know, cooking and that kind of thing, but um, it's been a difficult year. Uh, you know, some no. people have family members who are uh, compromised or, you know, it's, um, or, you know, they've just put out an amazing cookbook and they just don't have the time because they're traveling, um, putting out the word around their cookbook. So, yeah. um, but uh, we, um, you know, we'll have uh, lots of uh, different information on our website and uh, some vendors will be giving out information too um, about that. So, yeah. So what advice would you have for somebody trying to make that transition from a meat eating so, diet to an, uh, a vegan diet? Yeah. So I think, you know, looking at why you're doing it, you know, if you think about all of the climate issues, and I can talk about those um, as well, but, and also, um, you know, I think once people stop eating animals or think, you know, start thinking about uh, making that transition, if they actually look at the animals who they're eating and how, you know, similar they are to the animals that we have in our lives that we love, you know, um, there's, um, there, there just is, is really no difference in their, you know, they, they all have characters, they're all individuals, they mm -hmm. all feel pain and all of that. So, you know, when we look at all of that, that's, you know, we start to think about that it, it really isn't necessary because I think that this is going to taste better than this, when in reality it doesn't, you know, like they've done tests, uh, they've done taste tests with top chefs who don't know the difference between um, the um, uh, meat 
um, and, uh, you know, and the alternatives. So there really isn't any difference in the taste most of the time. But there are a number of um, uh, mentoring uh, programs out there um, that people can um, uh, can uh, use online free um, to help them go plant-based. Um, there is uh, Challenge 22, there's Veganuary, um, which is actually throughout the year. Um, they've helped a lot of people to transition. And, um, you know, there are many other uh, online, free online um, ways of, of transitioning. But, um, and another really good thing is to, you know, reach out to your local vegan society. Um, almost every major city and many of the minor, smaller cities as well have vegan societies and they're always happy to answer questions. Um, Can't say I've ever heard of a vegan society before, but I'll bet you well, run yeah. one. I'll bet you run one. <laughs> That's right. KW has a vegan society with, I think, 4,000 people. Um, and Cambridge has a vegan society. Uh, Stratford has a vegan and vegetarian group. Uh, London has a couple of vegan societies. Toronto has like five or six of them. So there are a million of them out there. Um, uh, Woodstock has one, uh, you know, so Mississauga, you know, so any city, any, anywhere you are, um, if you just uh, uh, search on uh, Facebook, um, you know, you can get information and, and lots of support. Um, people are happy to answer questions. And, is that a recent thing, vegan societies? Uh, the last few years, yeah. I think the KW one has been going for, oh, I should know this, probably, well, it was around when I became vegan, so that it's been around for at least six or seven years. So. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. And do you have links to that on the website, or should I um, do some Googling and, and figure out where these are and, and put them on our own website? I will send them to you, but I'm okay. I, I'm not certain that they're on our website. Um, but um, but that's a good thing that that's something that we should put on. Actually, I will have them uh, for so sure on the uh, Radio Waterloo website, radiowaterloo.ca slash ccc in the show notes for today's program. And I'm looking at the website uh, for kwvegfest.ca now. Yes, and uh, just. Seeing that uh, you've got a, a bunch of things in there, a list of uh, uh, speakers that you have, uh, a list of vendors that are on there. So um, lots of information at kwvegfest.ca as well. That's right. So, and, and um, as you said, we, we will have other things besides food as well. People will be selling shirts and um, buttons and uh, there's some, um, some climate friend, friendly uh, soaps and laundry soap and um, all kinds of things. Uh, KW Veg Fest is put on by um, uh, Kitchener Waterloo Climate Save, and uh, mm -hmm. we get some assistance from the City of Kitchener and from the Downtown Business Association. Um, but we do want people to think about the climate um, aspects uh, uh, related to um, related to eating animals. Um, it's uh, it's a transition that we need to make um, if we are going to have a future. Um, you know, we, it's the fastest thing that we can do and it's the easiest thing that an individual can do as well, mm -hmm. um, is to make that transition. But we also need to put pressure on governments, um, you know, to start, uh, walking the talk, you know, yeah, and it's, it's um, and, veganism is one yeah. of the four things that I know of that actually make a difference for individual, uh, things on climate change. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard it said that you can stop flying. That's an important thing where, that an individual can do. You can um, stop driving so much or, or uh, switch to uh, an electric vehicle, perhaps. Um, you can reduce your family footprint. You know, consider whether or not um, children are, are a, a major contributor to, uh, to greenhouse gas emissions, believe it or not. Not, I'm, not that I'm advocating people... Uh, put away their kids or anything like that but it's it's definitely <laughs> something that uh, is an individual choice that will affect uh, climate change and then mm -hmm. switching to a meat-free diet is one of the biggest changes that uh, that you can make most everything else and you know, I would, switching to pl sorry. paper straws for example doesn't do the trick but yeah switching yeah. to a meat-free diet I, and I would, i'm sorry Paul. go ahead go ahead I keep thinking you're done. And, the, and I, I would say uh, switching to a plant-based diet because, um, you know, uh, dairy and eggs also have a, a big impact on the uh -huh. planet too, uh, just in terms of, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, of course, because most of the dairy um, that people consume comes from cows and, and we know that they have a huge impact on the planet. Um, but also, you know, the water, um, the water use, uh, the land use, you know, so when we're raising food um, for animals, 
and we're grazing animals, we that land is is not being used for um, is, is not has been taken away from natural grasslands, marshes, and forests. You know, um, if we look at uh, the Amazon rainforest, is a perfect example. You know, um, more than 90% of the um, destruction of the Amazon rainforest has been for um, for grazing cattle and for raising food to feed them. You know, so um, it's a huge change, and it's a change that we need to make. Yeah. Um, and you know we need to really seriously start talking about it. You know, on a massive scale. Um, you know, I mean, the the, the United Nations has uh, has um, uh, and, you know issued a red alert for humanity. You know, um, yeah. and you know we have to make this choice every day, and um, and it, it's it's not a difficult uh, transition to make. You know, once. Once you know what to do, it's really actually quite simple. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's so much support out there. And we need to do it as individuals, but also we need, you know, uh, to put pressure um, around that as well. So uh, Climate Save, um, that's, that's some of what we do on a, on a local level, but also internationally. Um, and so Kitchener-Waterloo Climate Save is part of um, international groups and works on that um, from an international perspective. Uh, uh, on an international level as well. And um, one of the things that's come out uh, this year, and we will have some information about it at, at VegFast is um, uh, quite recently in August actually was launched the plant-based treaty uh, to help people, yes. you know, so people can go to plantbasedtreaty.org and sign up um, to uh, go plant-based and also, you know, help uh, influence uh, uh, others to do the same. So uh, locally, actually we have, um, uh, a champion, um, a city councillor um, who has uh, 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 signed on as well, uh, Debbie Chapman, and um, in in Guelph, uh, city councillor uh, Gordon, uh, what's his name, James Gordon, James Gordon um, yeah. has also signed on. Um, there is uh, one of the people who has put together the uh, the IPCC report in the past has signed on to the plant based treaty and and endorsed it. Um, and you know we we really uh, we're we're really trying to push this on an international level, but to get governments at all levels uh, talking about it and doing something about it. You know our government, um, you know for the first time when the new Canada Food Guide came out in 2019, our government um, uh, for the first time they they looked at the science and didn't have input from the industry. Right. And so what they came up with is the science says that we need to eat more plant based food for our own health and for the planet. Right. Yeah. So, you know, the science is all there. The information is all there. We just need to pay attention to it and do something about it. You know, right. and sorry, that's um, Joni has making some comments <laughs> for us as well. So, and he will. So you have cats, obviously. There. I do. The, I do. How do cats become vegan? Uh, well, there is uh, now, uh, this is a huge controversial, you just opened a huge one. <laughs> oh, there, yeah, Bob, that's, but, that's what um, radio is for. <laughs> that's right. Um, and I'm happy to talk about it. Um, and there, is, um, uh, there is now uh, plant-based cat food. So uh, the, uh, cats are obligate carnivores. So there's no argument about that. Um, but what they're so obligated to have is, is the elements in, in uh, meat, not the actual meat, right? right? But when you say uh, obligate so the, carnivore, that, that's, that's a word I don't know. Well. Uh, so it, it means they are obligated to eat meat, so they can't just eat vegetables, right? But all of the elements that they need, except for taurine, um, all of the elements are um, present in plants. Taurine, however... Um, is is only present in meat, but um, years ago, a few years back, I think it was in the 80s or 90s, they discovered that cats were getting sick eating uh, commercial cat food. And that's because the taurine that's present um, in the meat is killed in the processing um, that's necessary to preserve a dead body in a can mm. or a bag of food, right? So, so they started, they created a synthetic taurine and if you look at any bag of commercial cat food, it's, it's present in almost all of them, um, you will see that taurine has been added, and that is synthetic taurine. So 
since there is synthetic taurine now, um, cats can be plant-based. So um, the taurine okay. that my cats get, I have five cats and they're all about four and four and a half years old. Um, the taurine that they get um, is the uh, same as any other cat is getting, if even if they're eating dead animals. So. Right. Uh, because taurine is taurine no matter what the source of it is, right? It's a, the the molecule right, yeah. is the same. That's right. And in 2019, um, at our VegFest, um, we had a Dr. Sarah Dodd, from, um, who is a veterinarian and a nutritional specialist at the Ontario Veterinary College associated with the University of Guelph. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Sarah Dodd spoke at our 2019 VegFest, and she does research on, on this, and she says cats can be vegan. Cats can be, well, we say plant-based, right? Because vegan is a, a an ethical choice that the cats aren't making, right? So, uh -huh. but they enjoy their food. They get lots of treats. They enjoy it very much. So. Okay. So you say vegan, the term is an ethical choice. It's not just. That's right. So when somebody is plant-based, it means that they, um, you know, they eat, they, they eat um, uh, plants yes. rather than animal products. Um, but when somebody is vegan, they are um, making a choice to be, um, to, they're making, um, they're doing it as an ethical choice. So they also don't wear, don't wear any animal products. And oh. um, so I, I would say, and it, you know, it varies how everyone interprets it, I think varies. But for me, um, something like palm oil is technically it's plant-based. But for me, it's not vegan because it hurts animals and it hurts the planet, right? So for me, you know, that's that's part of it for me. So, I mean, everybody interprets it um, a bit differently, but okay. I think um, the terms the terms aren't exactly equal. So. Okay, so vegan is, is more than just a plant-based diet. That's right. It's, it's, um, yeah. it's yeah. an ethical stance, okay. yeah, okay. Um, to, to not use or exploit animals. So... Uh, somebody who is um, vegan wouldn't go to a zoo. Um, they wouldn't uh, ride a horse normally, you know, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. So they don't use animals in any way. Right, right. And I guess that that's what I thought veganism was to, to start with, you know, just the, uh, the ethical choice to protect the animals. Yeah. Um, the climate aspect of a plant-based diet, um, I only learned about yeah. that, you know, fairly recently in the last five years or so. Uh, and that's yeah. really what, what convinced me to remove meat from my diet. Yeah. Not that I'm entirely meat-free at the moment, but uh, I have that confession to make. But it's far, far better than uh, than my diet used to be. Yeah. But And for me, that's actually... I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no go, go ahead. I was just going to say, for me, that's actually what turned me to, um, as well. So I was pescatarian and vegetarian uh, for a number of years. And for me, that was around, um, you know, the, the rights of the animals. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of felt like I should be vegan, but I wasn't. Um, but I saw climate change um, with my own eyes. Um, when I was in British Columbia, I used to live in British Columbia and I hadn't been there in seven years. And when I went out um, a few years back uh, and I saw the change, I, I was absolutely stunned um, that I could see it with my naked eye. You know, the people who are living there every day don't see it because right. it's gradual, right? Yeah, yeah. And when seven years have gone by, you know, and, and you go, I mean, seven years is, is a drop in the bucket, you know, um, if we look at our whole history. But I could see the change, and I was just shocked at how, you know, how dry everything was um, in the summer. Things aren't even brown. They're yellow. It's so dry. Um, we were at a... Uh, we were at a lake. Um, I, I went out to uh, a women's camp that I had been part of before, and we're out on a lake in the middle of, you know, the island on Vancouver Island. And um, there was a fire close by. Um, we had smoke in camp. Some days we were told we had to stay inside. Um, we watched them come with these massive buckets to take the, the water from the lake to, to the, um, to the uh, fire. We were told we might be evacuated. You know, um, and I didn't know this because it's just not really talked about. But you know, my friends who live there told me that um, they're not allowed to wa to water their lawns or um, wash their cars all summer. Um, uh, if you you know if you um, bring a water bottle or smoke 
in a, um, a provincial park or any of the parks, you know, that the uh, provincial or federal parks, you can be like jailed for six months, you know, like you can have wow. like $10,000 fines, and, you know, so it's serious, you know, and we need to, we need to do something. So I came home from that trip. Oh, and, I, and then when I flew home, I don't fly anymore. Um, but when I flew home, um, when we, uh, you know, we watched more fires rolling in from Washington State when I was leaving Vancouver, and we landed in Calgary to change planes, and you couldn't see the mountains for the smoke, you know. So, I mean, Western Canada is on fire. Uh, Northern Ontario has been on fire this year. Um, we have flooding. We have fires. You know, we almost lost Toronto Island, you know. So it's coming for us. You know, we're not seeing it in our back door right now. So we're not taking it as seriously, but it's coming. You know, it's coming. We know yeah. it's coming. Yeah. So that, that switching to a plant-based diet really helps with that sort mm. of thing. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. When I started doing... I. You know, I got involved politically after that, and I started doing more research and just, you know, understanding um, what we need to do is is massive. And a plant-based diet is a huge piece of that, and it's a huge piece that's being ignored. So that's part of what we're here, you know, Climate Save is, is all about, and, you know, putting on VegFest as well as um, to, to have a big vegan party, but also to, um, you know, to get people to try plant-based food and... and to understand how fabulous it can be and yeah. and you know how it's not a sacrifice to make this change um yeah i'd like to take a bit of a break because need to digest that if you'll pardon the pun <laughs> um i'm going to have a, a quick listen to um sam and the terrible news uh punk punkish alt punk band from uh, from quebec this is a song called talkers Sam and the Terrible News with Talkers, um, punk rock band from Quebec. Unlikely we'll have them in the studio anytime soon, unless they happen to be touring in the area, but there's always a possibility for having a phone interview at some point. And having a phone interview right now, or a, a web conference interview, with Mo Markham from KW VegFest. Hello, Mo. 
Hello. Thanks for having me again. <laughs> You're very welcome. We've been talking about some of the things that bring people to veganism, or at least a plant-based diet. And one of the things that's been in the news, um, not so much recently, but in the, in the last year or two, um, is a an ag gag law. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah. So ag gag laws, um, I think, originated in the United States. Um, we import a lot of unfortunate things uh, from the United States, and this is one of them. Um, so they basically are um, uh, laws to uh, protect um, um, animal farms, essentially. Um, and um, so what happens uh, is a lot of times that um, uh Activists will go, uh, or activists or undercover workers will go on to uh, these farms to um, see what's happening and videotape what's happening and um, report it, right? And that has happened um, all over Canada and the United States. Um, there's, there have been, the practices have been exposed and um, usually quite appalling to people. Um, you know, they don't think beyond the piece of meat that's wrapped up um, in plastic, you know, on the grocery store shelf. Um, they don't really know what's behind it. And so people are quite appalled at, at uh, what happens in these places, um, how animals are um, being beaten and um, how they're had, uh, you know, so many of the things that are actually legal in Canada still. Mm -hmm. um, but when they're videotaped and people see them, they're appalled by them. So things like um, you know, when they have uh, runts or um, uh, piglets that uh, they don't think are, are going to make it or are, aren't going to fatten up quickly enough, it's perfectly legal and acceptable and normal practice to smash the pig's head into uh, the conc a concrete floor to kill them. That's, that's a method that's used um, for um, male chicks. Of course, uh, chickens, um, male uh, roosters don't lay eggs. Um, so they um, they either um, throw them in a bag to and close the plastic bag and let them smother to death, or they macerate them. They put them in a grinder. Um, the males the males when they're a day or so old. So all these things, um, you know, like um, castrating uh, animals without anesthetic. All of these things are perfectly legal and um, you know acceptable. But when people see them and they see the filth that these animals live in. Um, this appalls them, and so uh, the animal farmers have gotten together with legislators to uh, to try to silence. That's the gag part to try to silence right. activists and um, give them ma massive fines and le legal repercussions uh, for um, exposing what's happening in these places. Yeah. So you say it's acceptable, but acceptable only in that it isn't illegal. It's probably not socially acceptable, uh, no, but the reason no. that it still carries on is because nobody knows this because these practices yep. aren't exposed to the public. That's right. Most right. people don't understand, and they don't understand how filthy these places are and um, how, uh, how, you know, <laughs> disease-ridden they are, right? Um, so um, one huge um, issue... Um, that is becoming problematic for us is antibiotic resistance, right? Um, so people get sick um, and they end up in hospital and, you know, uh, the antibiotics that we have that, that should be able to help people um, when they have infections are less and less effective because most of the antibiotics, you know how they, they tell you that, you know, doctors shouldn't be um, you know, uh, prescribing antibiotics willy nilly because it, you know, it, it they become less effective. Well, something like 80% of the antibiotics uh, sold in Canada and the United States are actually going to farmed animals, right? And so, um, so that and, and when people eat these animals and their products, then uh, the antibiotic resistance is is just increasing in our population, right? So, so the antibiotics that we have can't help us anymore because, or, or you know, less and less, um, because we are feeding so many of them to farm animals. We're feeding them to farm animals because the conditions that they live in are filthy. Um, they're living in their own excrement most of the time because, you know, this is not like one or two animals out on, you know, the grass on a, in a, uh, uh, on a farm. These are hundreds or thousands, and sometimes tens of thousands, depending on the kinds of animals in one, one building, right? Um, and, um, you know, the, the sheds, 
are, you know, cleaned, you know, every few weeks. But, um, you know, uh, animal activists have exposed, you know, uh, have exposed the conditions, uh, animals uh, defecating and urinating on the same floor that they're eating off of. Uh, that was um, uh, the, I think it's called ProReg. That's a, um, that was a pig farm in, in uh, Quebec um, in the last year or so, or year or two. Um, activists have exposed that. Um, they've exposed, um, um, Malcolm Klimowitz, who used to live here mm -hmm. locally in, in uh, KW area, he um, went on a number of bink farms across um, um, across uh, Ontario and uh, videotaped the conditions. Um, and, uh, you know, there were the excrement uh, from the animals, uh, you know, there were there were um, uh, maggots um, in, in uh, you know, in the excrement. And there was just like layers of the excrement on the ground. Um, so all of these things, the you know the industry, which is like some makes a lot of money and also gets a lot of money from our government, our governments, shall I say, um, the industry um, doesn't want these secrets exposed. So what they um, they put pressure on governments to create these ag gag laws to stop activists or make the the. Um, uh, the fines massive and and the repercussions massive. So we already have trespassing laws, right? Um, so if somebody trespasses on a farm, um, you know they can be charged as uh, you know under trespassing laws, right? But these um, these are these ag ag laws are meant to be punitive, right? And um, to basically dissuade um the activists and the undercover workers from doing this right so in the united states um many of the ag ag laws have been uh, overturned um and and yet uh, canada is starting you know is starting up on creating them so in the last couple of years ontario and alberta have put in ag ag laws i think one of the maritime provinces as well um, um uh, and uh, Canada was proposing one as well, but I'll tell you what's happened. Uh, of course, because of the election, um, you know, all the bills that were um, before um, Parliament before um, before the election have have kind of died. Yeah. Um, but what what happened was um, uh, there was uh, um, pressure uh, to add a section to um, to the to the the um, legislation that would make it um, so that if farm workers, so part of, part of the reason that they um, create these, you know, they pretend that, that this is for the safety of the public, right? Mm -hmm. Because if, if, um, if activists come onto the farms and um, uh, spread disease, right? Or spread the disease from one shed to another, or from one farm to another, um, then, um, that's problematic, right? But what actually happens is the activists um, wear uh, full biohazard gear um, when they're in these uh, situations. Um, but the reality is um, that, uh, you know, the, our, our pandemic risk um, and, um, you know, the risk of zoonotic diseases is really quite high yeah. um, because of the conditions that these uh, farm animals live in. So what happened with the federal ag ag law is that they wanted, um, they, there was pressure um, to add to the legislation that any farm worker or farmer who also um, went into um, these uh, sheds, et cetera, and um, spread uh, disease um, could also be charged. So the industry wasn't going to go for that. So I, um, but we didn't actually get to see what happened with that bill, right? right? Um, I but think it'll be reintroduced you know, massive, when, Parliament, yeah, sorry, when, when Parliament resumes. Do you think that bill will, will be uh, reintroduced? Do you have champions yeah, in I, federal Parliament to work on this? Yeah, I don't know. Um, we'll have to see uh, what what happens for sure. Um, but the industry is, um, of course, not going to want that piece of it. You know, like they don't want to admit that that they're the ones. I mean, yeah. there has never been a um, a, um, a disease or virus spread by activists going in to expose the conditions in these places. It's spread because the conditions are filthy. People who work there every single day get, you know, um, get lazy about um, or just get, you know, uh, they just don't pay attention to um, the, the, um, the, the possibility of the risk of 
the, the risk of spreading disease. Yeah. I and imagine, so they too, just that, that a lot of the work. workers who are there are the marginalized yeah. workers, you know, the day workers, the, uh, right. the migrant workers, the foreign workers, mm -hmm. um, at the low end of the pay scale who really don't have the time to be working on um, you know, preventative measures to uh, protect themselves, to protect the animals, because they're yeah. just working as hard as they can to earn as, as much as they possibly can, yeah. because it's such awful work, really. Right, it is. And and most of them are migrant workers because, of course, um, you know, fruits and vegetables um, are more the, the migrant workers, but mm, okay. the, um, 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 the um, uh, you know, the, the factory farms, they're year-round, yeah. right, and slaughterhouses, um, really uh, risking, um, really putting us at risk. Um, and we don't understand um, the risk that, that we're, you know, that they pose. Um, and, um, so you know, we, we, one of the groups that will be... Sorry, go ahead. Is, is this something recent? Because uh, what I've been hearing um, is farmers are, are proud of their industrialization of agriculture. And, uh, you know, with family mm -hmm. farms, I don't think family farms were ever considered industrialized. And so if... What was this as prevalent? Was the uh, the abuse, the filthy no. conditions as prevalent when yeah. uh, people who owned the farms knew the animals? You know, uh, with industrialization, sure. animals are just a product. You know, uh, so many yeah. uh, so many soybean seeds uh, and so many piglets, and uh, uh, yeah. in industrial agriculture, and they're somewhat equiv equivalent. Yeah, so that has certainly changed because farms have become just um, massive uh, now. Um, but what we call family farms, because, you know, even though they're family owned, you know, the, a family farm may be, you know, is, is a factory farm as much as any other. So across the world, more than 90 percent of animal products come from um, from um, factory farms. And in North America, that's well over 95 percent. Right. So we have this vision of you know animals out on you know on pasture and stuff that doesn't happen right that's not what happens with most of the animals and it was it was certainly different uh years ago um and it's become much more industrialized so you know um it's hard for for animal farmers to survive with you know less than a certain amount of of animals um you know to to sell so you know for, you know, a small operation would be still hundreds of animals, but many of them have tens of thousands, and that's just becoming more and more concentrated. Right. And so, and sometimes tens of thousands of animals like chickens or ducks, et cetera, in one shed, right, in one building. And so the pandemic risk, the virus risk, the risk for zoonotic diseases is massive. But anytime you have genetically similar animals, right? They're basically, and, and especially when they're living in these conditions, right? They're, um, they're, it's like a Petri dish for viruses, right? And so, we, um, and actually Dr. Uh, Tushar Mehta will be talking about, about that at, um, at VegFest, he's one of our speakers. Um, and uh, there will be a, um, a uh, nonprofit called uh, Eating Animals Causes Pandemics that will be there um, as well. Um, and um, I'm part of that group as well, just helping people to understand. But anytime you have genetically similar animals, um, so when viruses mutate, they just have much more opportunity for that, right? If, if all of the animals are genetically similar and they're living in a, in a small area. So if we look at something like the Spanish flu, which was a swine flu um, that with avian origins, um, that came out of the United States, as far as, as we can tell at this point, likely um, from Kansas. Um, so it was called the Spanish flu, but it wasn't actually from Spain. Um, and that was in 1918, 1919, right? Um, so there would have been, you know, at that point, probably at most, you know, a few hundred um, genetically similar animals. Um, but, you know, look what happened. More than 50 million people across the world died, you know? And, and we have had actually swine flu and bird flu here in Canada. We've had um, people infected um, with swine flu here in Canada um, just this year and in the United States as well. Um, and, you know, these, uh, these viruses exist all over the world at all the time. Um, just this year, I think like a dozen different countries have had avian uh, flu. 
Um, and sometimes that has passed to humans as well. So China, India, um, uh, France, uh, Russia, Russia, I think it passed to humans as well. So, you know, these things are all there. They're all there and they're all, all the time. And it's really, we're playing Russian roulette, right? Yeah. We're playing Russian roulette because the next pandemic may well be much worse than this one. You know, um, the scientists actually expected the next one would likely be either a swine flu or a bird flu. Yeah. And some of the bird flus, um, the avian flus, you know, their death rate is so much higher than COVID. So COVID has a death rate of one to 2% of people who acquire it. Uh, some of the uh, avian flus, the death rate is like 30% or higher, you know? Yeah. So, you know, so there's no good reason to eat animal, yeah. animals and animal products. No. There just isn't. There's so many reasons not to, you know? Yeah. Have somebody at uh, KW Veg Fest this Sunday who's addressing that particular issue? Yes, um, that's right. Dr. Tushar Mehta, um, he and a couple of other people. Sorry, my cats always do this when I'm on when I'm on in an interview. They're just they're so quiet the rest of the time. As soon as I'm in an interview, they start doing this. Um, but he and a couple of other people started um, a page called PlantBasedData.org. So all okay. kinds of information, scientific uh, studies, and and uh, uh, around um, animal agriculture um, and health. Um, and what it's doing to our health, what it's doing to the planet, and what it's doing, you know, the risk that it's posing in terms of viruses as well. Um, and uh, and they, they go through some of the uh, scientific studies and explain them for people, you know, help them to, to understand it. So it's a fabulous resource. Um, it's not as user-friendly as I would like, um, but also um, eatinganimalscausespandemics.com, all kinds of scientific information there and, um, uh, video videos of um, of um, uh, of uh, scientists talking about uh, the issue, etc. There's okay. tons of information on there and on Facebook as well. Same same eating animals causes pandemics. And it's all happening on Sunday. Sunday, September 26th at the Kitchener Farmers Market, um, 10 to 4. And uh, there will be lineups. Uh, we know that, um, but. Um, um, we think it'll be worth it. There will be also live music um, out and everything is outside except for the speakers. And uh, again, the speakers, um, we will uh, post videos of the speakers on our uh, Facebook or Facebook and uh, website. Okay, so we're recording uh, this on uh, Monday, September the 20th, 2021. Mm -hmm. We'll probably re-air this uh, on our Saturday edition. So you can, uh, if you've missed part of uh, what Mo's had to say about uh, animal agriculture, veganism, and uh, KW Veg Fest, you'll be able to hear it again on uh, Saturday, the 25th of September, from uh, 1 to 2 p.m. on our second edition of uh, CKMS Community Connections. Mo Markham, I just want to thank you very, very much for being on the uh, show today. It's been marvelous to have you back on the air. <laughs> Always fabulous um, and much appreciated, Bob. Thanks for all you do. Thank you, Mo. So go out to KW Veg Fest on uh, Sunday, the 26th. You'll have a wonderful time. Uh, you'll have food to eat. Um, life is good. I want to listen to a little bit of uh, Stuart McKee. Stuart McKee is uh, our host for um, Musicians FAQ, and he's got a new album out, I think, called Save Me a Seat. So we'll be listening to uh, the hardest part from the album. This is Stuart McKee. Guess it wasn't that hard for you to lay down my heart. Walk away while I fall apart. I'm left behind with pieces to You've been listening to CKMS Community Connections. My name is Bob Jonkman. 
CKMS Community Connections is a production of Radio Waterloo and is sponsored by Radio Waterloo. The executive producer is Jennifer Strong. Associate producers are Jeff Steger, Jordan Dorans, uh, Dylan Bravener, and Steve Todd. Steve Todd also did our theme music that you heard at the opening. CKMS Community Connections airs every Monday from 11 o'clock till noon and again on Saturdays from 1 o'clock to 2 p.m. We have interviews with interesting people like Mo Markham. We have interviews with uh, musicians and we have lots of new music from uh, Canadian content artists and uh, very often from uh, artists in uh, Kitchen or Waterloo. Bye everybody. See you next week.